Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. Um, my name is Laura Dawood, and I work at the Council of the Baltic Sea States uh, that is hosting this webinar today. Um, I would like to start by uh, mentioning some housekeeping rules um, so that everyone is aware uh, of. Um, the webinar will be recorded uh, and it will be available later on on YouTube. And uh, during the webinar, participants will not be able to turn on their cameras or microphones, but are welcome to use the chat function or Q and A um, if they if they have questions. Uh, and there will be a short poll section of three questions, both at the beginning of the webinar and at the end of the webinar, that we'd like you to answer uh, them. And uh, now I can we can start with the first poll. So I'd like to ask Kierne if uh, she could. Yes, it's already shared. So please, uh, if you can uh, go ahead and answer these questions. Thank you so much. Uh, and next, before getting started, I'd like to ask you if you could write in the chat your name and the country you come from. Thank you. I'll just give you a few seconds to do that. And meanwhile, I will share my screen. Um, so this webinar is uh, organized in the context of Journeys project. Um, which is a co-funded uh, project by the European Union, and it uh, seeks to improve access to child-friendly friendly justice, protection, and recovery for children, uh, victims, and uh, child victims and their families throughout the uh, the provision or uh, through the uh, provision of a safe, informed, and participat participatory pathway through Barnahus, from initial report to long-term ter recovery. And more specifically, uh, Journeys will design and pilot in both countries, Sweden and Ireland, uh, and evaluate an adaptable working method, including a child liaison which, uh, who ensures the child is heard, feels comfortable, and is safe to participate effectively. Uh, the project will also develop practical and child-friendly tools to inform child victims and caregivers and to log their journeys through the Barna House. And it will also raise awareness uh, and advocacy on local, regional, and national level in Sweden, Ireland, and, and, and at the EU, EU level. And today we will focus on the Barnahus Quality Standard 5, which is central to the work uh, that is carried out in the context of Journeys Project. Uh, with us, we have uh, Olivia Lind Halderson, head of the Children at Risk Unit at uh, the C Council of the Baltic Sea States and president of the Promise ba Barnahus Network, who is also the author of the Barnahus Quality Standards. 
And we also have Anna Peterson, who is the manager of Barnahus uh, Lean Shopping in Sweden. Uh, Anna made a substantial contribution to the development of the Barnahus quality standards and has a long experience of working in Barnahus. Um, I would like to encourage you to post, uh, as I mentioned earlier in, in the chat, your specific questions uh, to Anna or Olivia so that we ad can address the things that you are here to learn about. Uh, and please do let us know what you would be interested uh, in hearing more about in the, in the chat so that the webinar is as useful as possible for you. I will now hand over to Olivia for a brief introduction to standard five, and then we'll hear from Anna about the importance and uh, practicalities of working together in Barnahus. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, first, I would like to say that I took note in the Q&A that the chat seems to be disabled for uh, participants, uh, so I don't know if one of our hosts can help us with that. Otherwise, I suppose we'll just have to uh, use the Q&A. Yes, they, they can use the Q&A instead of the chat. That's okay. perfectly fine. Thank you. Thank there you. we go. Please use the Q&A and Laura will uh, monitor it and, and uh, try to extract questions from any other information that you put in there. But thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, we uh, will be talking about the Barnahus, we'll be talking about the standards and uh, most importantly, we will be getting some information from Anna about how the standard uh, can be implemented. And um, as I am sure you all are all aware of who are joining us today, the Barnahus model is uh, recognized as a leading model for multidisciplinary interventions and collaboration for child victims and witnesses of violence. And to ensure that the Barnahus doesn't depart from the international standards, the core principles and evidence-based practice that really are inherent to the model, uh, we have uh, in the Promise Barnahus network developed uh, criteria, uh, which include that there must be a balanced approach, including all four disciplines uh, in the kind of multidisciplinary architecture, and that is uh, protection, justice, physical and mental health. And we have also developed the Barnahus quality standards, uh, and they were developed through a collaborative process involving practitioners and experts from across Europe. And before I uh, move on to speaking about the standard and specifically standard five, I just very briefly wanted to um, mention, as uh, Laura said, uh, I, we work for the Council of the Baltic Sea States, uh, which is an intergovernmental organization that hosts a Barnahus network, which gathers uh, Barnahus and uh, other stakeholders interested in the Barnahus model um, from a broad range of countries uh, in Europe. And uh, you can visit our uh, website, barnahus.eu, for more uh, information. And as I said, the uh, criteria and the standards were developed as a collaborative uh, process involving uh, our members, but also other uh, uh, stakeholders. And the standards are really meant to guide um, the operating procedures of Barnahu. So they are very practical. And they focus on things like fundamental principles, such as the best interest of the child, uh, child participation, preventing undue delay. Uh, they focus on how you organize yourself uh, and how you carry out uh, joint case management that we are here to talk about today. 
And they also specifically guide all the areas of intervention in the Barna House. For example, the child forensic interview, the medical examination, therapeutic interventions, uh, etc. And finally, they also provide input on building staff capacity, uh, ensuring that staff um, get peer support and supervision and prevent a burnout, for example. Uh, but they also focus on prevention work, uh, such as uh, data collection, sharing information, and engaging with um, stakeholders uh, that work with children who may uh, come to Barna House. And if you are interested in a full presentation of our Barna House quality standards, you can visit our website again, barnahus.eu, uh, where you will find webinars, but also uh, publications, and you'll find the, the standards both in a long and short version. Um, but today we're here to talk about joint case management and more specifically standard five. Um, I think it's really important to begin by saying that standard five is one of those standards that connect to all the other standards and that connect to all the practice in Barna House. And therefore, when you look at it and when you think about the practice that we described there, you should read it in conjunction with the other standards. And the key purpose of standard five is to form a joint understanding of the needs of the child and to together develop the specific interventions and actions that need to be taken in all different uh, areas of intervention so that each child receives a comprehensive approach that is adapted to its specific needs and circumstances. And it also uh, ensures to aim structures and practice so that the child and the caregivers receive information about the process continuously and without undue delay so that they can be empowered to also engage in their own case management and influence the interventions that they are offered in uh, Barna House. Um, maybe you can go back to the slide there. Yes, standard five, interagency case management. So as you can see on this slide, it has, a standard five has four elements. And the first element concerns establishing formal procedures and routines for joint case management, uh, so that this is a, a structured approach. Um, when we hear from Anna later on, I think one of our key messages is that interagency case management, it just doesn't happen like that, just because you gather under one roof. Um, there's some, uh, you know, rules, uh, routines, uh, guidelines for how the interagency case management can be best carried out. Um, and the second and the third elements uh, emphasize that this is a continuous process. Uh, we often see that um, there are initial case management meetings and that they happen regularly, but in some, uh, we, all, Barna House, we also see that it doesn't happen regularly, and therefore we emphasize that it has to be a continuous process um, so that the interventions stay appropriate and relevant, but also so that we just don't drop the child in it and and uh, you know, stop our interventions to ensure that they have information and can influence uh, their interventions. The best way to learn about these standards, which uh, can, even though they are very practical, sometimes can feel a bit theoretical, is of course to hear from someone who practices it. And I'm really glad that we have Anna here today um, with us uh, because she's really the expert. But before I move on to Anna, I just want to note one thing first, and that is that beyond the work that we are doing in the Journeys project, I'm also really glad to say that we this year will be working with another expert, Emma Harewood, 
to develop a practical implementation guide for standard five. And this will draw on practice from across Europe, and it will also be a collaborative and consultative process. So stay tuned for that guidance. It will be published uh, on our website, hopefully, uh, towards the end of, of this autumn. And then just before I move on to Anna and my first question, Laura, are there any questions from the audience at this stage? No, not at this stage, so okay. we can move ahead. That's perfect, thank you. So then, Anna, you have a very long experience working uh, together across sectors in Barna House. And as a manager, you really play a central role in ensuring that that interagency collaboration and case management runs smoothly. So um, what are your kind of opening or general thoughts about the importance of joint case management and having a structured approach like the one that is recommended in standard five? And also, uh, how does that help you to address some of the key challenges that you have within the Barna House? Perhaps you want to share a few key challenges with us as well, just to kick off. Hey, thank you so much. And thank you for, for listening to me, everyone. Uh, it's so many things to say, <laughs> but I trust you, Olivia, to, to kind of guide me to, to not to forget important things. Uh, well, to start with, um, all the professionals in our Barna House, and I guess in all kind of Barna House likely models <laughs> in Europe, uh, they of course they want to do the best for the children, according to what they have to take into account, like um, laws, routines within the prosecutor's office, social welfare office, and so on. But that is is not really enough. That you really want to to do good for the children and work together. Uh, you all know that. You, I guess you, all of you have, have um, worked together with each other or other professionals and so on. And you know that re you really have to have something to lean on. You have to have written documents, uh, agreements, and so. Um, so that is kind of, that, that is, you have to lean on that. And, and then, of course, um, our main, our kind of the, the basic uh, agreement that we have um, is not something that we really look at daily in a daily basis. Uh, but from that, we have kind of created different kind of routines that really mean something in our daily work. But when it really comes to um, tough points in the cooperation, we can always kind of, okay, wait a minute, our cooperation agreement says this, let's, let's do this, no? So, um, what we have noticed is that uh, when we, during all these years, uh, we can kind of, uh, we, if, we, if we summon up all these years, we can see that when it has been uh, it hasn't been that good in kind of in some cases. We aren't really pleased with the outcome or how it has been for the child. Most often, almost always, it has been cases that has not followed the the routines and the structure and so on that we actually have. For some reason or another, we have to we have had to, you know, <laughs> take different tank kind of turns. But most often it doesn't lead to something good. So it's very important with, to have kind of written agreements and all kind of different routines that you follow. And you mentioned something about challenges, Olivia. <laughs> Yeah, maybe um, I was just going to say, so yes. can you be a bit more specific about some of the challenges that you can yes. address because you have uh, case management routines and procedures? Well, even though we have these routines, uh, a very big challenge is to when all these professionals 
for example, now the police, uh, the, the people doing the forensic interviews with the children here, the very, very lack of staff. Um, and then it's tougher to, to follow the routines, of course. And these kind of things are that we, we in the Bonners team or in, in our working group, we can't really change that overnight, but we can kind of shout to the police uh, management and, and do what we can, of course. But a challenge is that when it when it is about resources within all these different uh, part, collaboration partners, and it can be like in the social welfare office now, it's not about money. <laughs> It's not. It's just like they can't get people to 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 them to their positions. So that's one big challenge. Another challenge is that what I see as the child's best interest is maybe not what the prosecutor sees as the child's best interest or the social worker. Uh, so different kind of professions have their own glasses on, and also. We work together with three different prosecutors, and they also have sometimes different glasses on. <laughs> so for us, it's like flexibility is our middle name here in the Bonhoeffs team. We all really, really have to be like you know, in between and kind of say, OK, now she thinks like that. OK, now he thought like I really. So that is kind of a challenge to, to meet there. Uh, everyone wants the best for the child, but we sometimes have a little bit different thoughts about that. Yeah, it sounds like in all teamwork that you have to be able to compromise and I guess having those um, collaboration agreements and the procedures and the routines in place can kind of help you manage that work and kind of so that people at least kind of keep in, in line. Yes, and um, also if because it's very important for us to kind of uh, understand each other's possibilities and limitations within our professions so we don't just you know get angry or, or irritated with it, with each other you'll just kind of okay this is not good but i understand that you you have to take this make this decision according to what you have to lean on okay we don't like it but we can understand it mm -hmm. it's very important so to have a kind of good um, open uh, air about things yes yeah. mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Just a, a small question uh, for clarification, because you may mentioned your uh, collaboration agreement, and maybe not everyone is aware exactly of what a collaboration agreement is. Could you tell us what it is and what it contains and who actually signs up to it? Yes. Well, uh, the, the agreement we have now, uh, it, it was written 2019 I think it says like it, it's valid for five years and it will be renewed uh, two years uh, uh, plus two years if no one really kind of says no we shouldn't have this any, any longer but in this agreement it's it's it contains like the purpose of Barnahus, our target group um, how the organization looks like how the, the premises are and, and what will be included in the premises, um, what our, our aims are, what we want to do with this, and, and the staff, staff at Barnhouse team. The staff actually is in Barnhouse all the time. About economic questions, of course, um, and also secrecy, how to deal with that, and also documentation, how to deal with that. And also it mentioned that Every partner that has signed this also assure that their staff is going to be included in the, in the competence um, uh, raising uh, that we have. I see. And also, one very, very important thing is that each partner in men, are mentioned, and and then we kind of kind of let it checklist what they are commitment committed to do. If they sign this, they are committed to blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. The social welfare office are committed to do this. The prosecutor's office are committed to do this. So it's kind of, in that in that particular way, it's a little bit more detailed. Otherwise, it's more like common. Yeah. Terms. And, and it's, it's signed also by all partners, even those who are not really um, con contributing with the economy or into our budget. 
they are still uh, signing the contract, this uh, disagreement, the war disagreement. Mm. And this very much then kind of also shows the link between some of the standards. We have standard two, which yes. talks about the multidisciplinary uh, collaboration and the fact that it's so important to have that a collaboration agreement that you can go back to and kind of point to, okay, we have committed uh, to this. Uh, um, so I can see that, as you said, you don't look at it every day, but if there are issues concerning um, uh, the collaboration, then you can, can go back to that. But and you can also, I'm sorry, it can also be like more pra practical matters because um, one now and then maybe one of our uh, municipalities especially they they kind of raise the question okay is it really us that are going to get the children here to Bonhoeffs from their school or whatever isn't it someone else blah, blah, you know they kind of raise that question and then we can say okay we can just like ask that but then it's a very big issue because in the in the cooperation agreement it says like this mm -hmm. so it can be about kind of wider things but it can also be about more detailed things that we can we can lean on the agreement it's very mm. good mm. so so that's kind of a an important foundation for uh case management and, and we're gonna come back to the more kind of uh, practical uh, protocols etc a bit later but i guess one of the the big incentives also for uh, the different staff who are involved, who are kind of, who, who need to be at the center of that flexibility and making those compromises and building the trust, you know, that they feel that this collaboration and the joint case management is important to them, that yes. it actually benefits them. So can you tell us a little bit how you think that you know, the case management benefits, I mean, the child, of course, and, and the team as a whole, but also the, the respective practitioners who come and who actually have to engage in that case management. Yes, uh, of course, and the most important thing is that going into the bonus process, the child would be better after than before mm -hmm. uh, entering the process doing as less harm as possible in this difficult situation for the children that is kind of the the, the, the big issue that is very important uh, when it comes to to what the child benefits and that they can't they don't have to meet so many new faces uh, they don't have to tell the story over and over again they can get crisis intervention uh, without delay and so on these kind of things are what benefits the child and um the team as a whole is kind of the same we, we can share information we know things it's easier for us to to kind of be like you know the the helicopter that kind of gets have the 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 overall picture uh and when it comes to the individual practitioners i i will ask laura to to um uh put up some pictures when with yes. quotes from the different professionals that we have made we have asked Now we see the, do you, do you also see the things on the left, Olivia, or is it just me? Uh, I also see the things on the left. I think uh, Laura is trying to get it on display mode so that we actually can see the screen a bit better. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm Sometimes it's really a little bit tricky. That... Yeah. Let me try to share it again. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can you see it on a uh, display mode now? No, no, I'm afraid not. Um, I don't know, maybe is, I can. It's okay like this. For me, it's okay like this. It doesn't, we... yeah, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> okay. 
I don't know why it's not it's not collaborating. <laughs> no, I know. I, I've been going through that myself. It's not that easy sometimes. It's tricky. It can be tricky. Well, okay. This is voices from the partners. Like the, the Mia Maria Eklund from the social services. She says like they win a lot of time uh, because we plan together. They don't have to to take all these contacts to to different kind of professionals. They do it in the one or some planning meetings, and that's kind of, we all can take uh, information and be a part of the information at the same time. And they say that they see a difference when they have bon like Bono's cases where there's no Bono's within the district, for example, with, an with another um, police uh, district, for example, or when they have children, uh, in foster care somewhere else and so on and something happens, they see that there is a difference when you have a bono house. And Peter Wiede, uh, one of the, he's the head of the pediatricians, the, the, the children hospital here. Uh, he really also says that having a well, well functioning and robust machinery really, really uh, facilitates a good communication between the partners that are working together and that, that makes the job easier. Um, and also that is the head of the child and adolescent psychiatry or she just was just recently. Uh, she says the same that this co co cooperation really makes the, the job easier for all of them. And then when it comes to the next slide is the, the police. Uh, these are two Two ladies that have been from the very beginning when we started in 2005, they, have, they just recently get retired, both of them, and we're so sad about that. But as you can see, they have been in the police for, for many, many years, and they have been working with child cases for over 20 years. Um, and they say that they're really clear with this, that if we, if they, they, they shouldn't have continued working with this. So for so many years, if they haven't had the Bono House and, and this teamwork and working together, uh, if it hadn't been this great, they shouldn't have been able to continue, they say. And also one important thing is that, uh, as they say that earlier, they were more bound to some enthusiasts, you know, this typical like that you have to have some persons or people that are really burning for this and, and really, uh, yeah, driving it forwards. Uh, but now when we have routines and, and agreements, you can lean on that as well. It's much more easier than to be dependent on uh, some enthusiasts. They also said that our working group is an important success factor. And that is many, and many of that we talk with have say the same. Yes. And the prosecutors, uh, they, they agree with the other ones that um, it makes their job easier. They don't have to do all these kind of contacts and do all these things they needed to do before. We do it all in this in one meeting uh, and we don't have to, to discuss formalities. Uh, we can really focus on the content and the child that is in focus uh, because the other things we have really already taken care of all the other formalities. Uh, they're down in the, in the agreement and other routines. Um, she also said that Bono's hasn't made a huge difference in the court, uh, but indirectly it contrib contrib to, contributes to, to raise the quality and to improve the legal structure. Uh, so it's better for the child, but maybe not that more, more cases get to get to court and so on. And, and it's not so nice for, for me to see that a prosecutor says that and the police really emphasize that the most important thing is not to get someone convicted, but to kind of that these children get help. Yes. Next one is just some some quotes for for from all the our partners. And you can see that it, it's about solving things together, uh, making a, having a strong children's perspective. And one said, you're all well looked after at Barnahus. And we really want to do, to. it's, it's important for us to, to get all these partners, all these people that we work with, really feel at home at our Barnahus. 
Yes. That was the Thank you, Anna. That's that's really helpful, and and just maybe uh, emphasizing some of the things that uh, your uh, collaboration and your joint case management um, then contributes. Uh, uh, like time saving, one of the standards is preventing undue delay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so case management contributes to the other standard in that respect. Uh, communication, teamwork, collaboration. Uh, that's, again, standard two and making sure that you can work as a team to achieve uh, a child-centered approach and, and out comes for children, as you say that the ch child leaves the Barna House in a better situation than when it came to the Barna House. Another thing that stood out to me is kind of the, the trust and the uh, support and the peer um, exchange uh, that seems to uh, be supported by case management. You also mentioned that it uh, raises quality uh, and I, I specifically thought about what you said uh, of um, making sure a child-centered approach. So it seems that there are some very kind of practical outcomes that contributes to uh, interventions across the, the Barna House and, and not only helps you to, to manage a case. Um, and, you know, as we noted before, it's very clear that case management, it, it just, it's not like just there. Uh, it doesn't only just happen. Um, and I'd love to hear uh, some examples of routines and protocols, some tools and best hacks uh, mm -hmm. that you have to ensure that this actually uh, becomes a reality. Yes. Well. I will, <laughs> but first I just want to say that um, for us in the team, it's important to, to have an active role and act, have an active part of the process so we can really um, take in and, and be able to address all kind of issues that will come up. For example, if I'm overhearing or looking at a child interview, uh, maybe some social workers says something that okay wait here we have to do something other you really have to be active to, to get all the time uh, pick up things that have to be um, in, evaluated and, and getting better so even though we have a structure it's very important to kind of be there uh, and constantly striving for getting better and and uh, evaluate what you do <laughs> But we have these joint consultation meetings every week uh, where we talk about the, the cases and different partners are uh, in this meeting. And it is a very important meeting. Um, that's where we kind of uh, decide uh, when we are gonna have this uh, interview, for instance, interview, for example, if the child has special, special needs or some whatever to, to take into account when we meet the child. Um, we in the Bonos team, we have make weekly team meetings, uh, the five or six of us working here all the time uh, to kind of keep up with what we are doing and not doing. Uh, of course, we have, as I mentioned, many formal documents and guidelines describing routines and, and, and procedures like in, in small ways and, and the big part. And we are really keen on not having routines that we don't need to that we don't look at then we can take away and you know it's not just to, to warm the shells as we say in sweden warm the bookshelves it has to be routines that really are making a difference that we are, are helpful for us uh, and once a month we have a working group that are um, meeting and they're in that working that we call working group uh, we have representatives from all partners so we, we are around 20 people meeting and when we started bonhaus 2005 thinking about what you said earlier olivia that that you just have to kind of continue doing it since <laughs> when we when we started bono 2005 we thought okay now in the beginning we had to meet as often as once a month and we still do no uh, because it's important 
uh, and the steering committee with the, the, the our bosses, <laughs> they meet like five times uh, a year. And I'm in that group, more like a little link between the working group and the steering group. I'm in that group. And I also want to mention as a part of the structure that it is a dedication and positive attitude that makes this happen. <laughs> no matter how many routines and written routines we have, it's about dedication to kind of follow this and, and to make want to make the best for the children, of course. But we have a lot of kind of checklists and whatever, you know, and we when we, when we kind of think about something, like how do we do this actually? Maybe we have to have like a little manual for this, and maybe we could we 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 ask the social workers, for example, do you need this checklist when you pick up the children? And maybe we say, yes, we will need this and this. Fine, we we fix that. And maybe sometimes we ask, do you need this checklist for this? And say, no, we don't. No, okay, you don't, because as I said, we don't want to have different kind of routines and written documents that we don't use. But I understand that, for example, for your meetings, you have a set agenda and yes. you also have a document that clarifies the roles of each uh, uh, professional in that meeting. So you That's do true. have things that you kind of follow. And then within the remits of the meetings, of course, uh, it's, it's up to everyone to play their part. That's true. That's true. And also these... Uh, Joint consultation meetings when we really talk about each child, we name the children. Uh, it's up to every partner, every professional to to kind of um, make their own documentation. Uh, it's it's their own responsibility to kind of say, okay, this I need for my job. Um, so you, we all have our different kind of responsibilities and and input into the meetings. Mm -hmm. But you also do have a joint case management tool. Yes, you mean me? Yes. Yes, we do. Uh, because there's a lot of statistics, anonymous, of course, the statistics that we want to, to gather, of course. And then we have this that we call Bonigi or the, the Promise Hub <laughs> in Promise Project is kind of the same company um, where we can get all kinds of different statistics, like a uh, number of cases, uh, ages of the children, gender, uh, crisis support, how many forensic interviews we have had, and so on, and from how many forensic interviews we have had that had a joint consultation meeting before, and who many hasn't, and so many, so many different things we can. I'm, I'm just sitting with the statistics from 2024 right now we're a little bit delayed because we, we moved our whole bono house <laughs> but now it's gonna into uh, yeah i'm doing that now but we our steering group uh, steering committee they said for some years ago that okay there's a lot of numbers but what do we actually need and what do we can we what what kind of numbers are um, good for us to know according to evaluation and what we want to get out of this. So it's also important just to get, not to get just gather numbers for the gathering itself, but also what, what we really want, what do we want to get out of it? And sometimes like now, for example, when the police officers are so, that so lack of staff, I really choose to, to look at some other parts that we haven't looked at earlier in the statistics, um, because really to help them with their management to, to kind of emphasize the importance of yeah, getting new stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's a very important um, um, to say, instrument or, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that you have very kind of solid frameworks and then you have your practical tools, uh, but then it's really up to you as a Barnos manager, but also all the professionals to make sure that they contribute and play their own specific role in the context of, of case uh, management. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And I can see that we have two questions in the chat. They are kind of uh, related to some of the things that we have uh, been talking to, to uh, talking about. 
Yes. Um, but, um, and they, first of all, there's a question about uh, multidisciplinary supervision and, and the kind of supervision that the team uh, receives. And then there are questions about the professional background of people who work in Barna Hoos and what training you specifically have for Barna Hoos. And I, if I may, I would like to park those two questions um, so that we can focus a little bit more on standard five uh, before we come back to those, because I think they are relevant to what we're talking about. But um, uh, we'll come back to them uh, towards the end, uh, if that's okay. Um, um, because we talked a little bit, we've talked about some of the challenges uh, that you are uh, have been exposed to. Um, but one of the things that we haven't mentioned and that I wanted to talk about specifically now is um, information sharing between your agencies, because we just touched upon the fact that each agency document their own information. And then you have your joint case management, which is more a tool, which is more for like statistical purposes, but which benefits all of the, the uh, team members. But there's also that element of sharing information that you hold. And this is a challenge that many, many Barna who's addressed to us uh, in terms of case management. How is this a challenge to you too? And how have you uh, addressed that? It is, Olivia, it is because uh, in Sweden, um, we have a loss of secrecy that really makes it a bit different, difficult for us to, to share information. Uh, we are in a gray zone right now, sharing it like we are, but we choose to be in a gray zone. <laughs> yeah. um, because, and it's about sharing information uh, we not, within these kind of um, joint consultation meetings that we have. Um, since the, there is a pediatrician, there's someone from the Schadenland and Psychiatry, uh, there are some from the police force, from the prosecutor's office, and from us. Uh, so different kind of professions. Uh, and in Sweden, it's like that. It, when a social welfare office have, has an assessment of the child, of a child, they are they are able to ask different authorities uh, for information. So far, so good. Mm. But here also, when they share, so when if they ask a pediatrician about information. Uh, and when the pediatrician then uh, tells the social work, social worker that information, others are in the room hearing that, and that's where the gray zone are for us in Sweden right now. So that is something that really uh, it's a, it's about laws. So we can't really change that, but there are also laws saying that you should collaborate uh, for the best of the children. So that's kind of these kind of laws we lean on to <laughs> say, okay. We, we choose to kind of say that these are more important when it comes to Barnard's cooperation. And, but we talk a lot about how can we really mention names in these meetings? Should we do in another way? When we document here at Barnard House, uh, we have to stop using names and, and the ID numbers. We have to find other ways according to our laws and so on. So this is a, it is an issue. It is. But I think you can you can choose two ways, either to say, OK, we can't have one we can't work this way. Or you can choose a way that say, OK, we have this issue. How to kind of work with this issue? How can we still work together? How can we still cooperate? How can we still share some information? Maybe if you share information with that person, maybe the third person doesn't have to listen. Then she can leave the room or whatever. You know, she, you have to find ways. Hmm. And also some one thing is about, about documentation that are talk, talked a lot about in Sweden now that Barna who's can't really, we can't have a documentation around the child uh, because the social welfare, welfare have their documentation and all different partners have their own documentation. So if the child wants to go back and, and read about things, she, he or she has to go to different authorities mm -hmm. mainly is the social welfare office that they can find information from it mm 
so these kind of two issues that are talked a lot about in Sweden. Mm. Mm. So kind of finding uh, your way and uh, it, it, I mean, what's interesting with the Barnos model is, of course, that it has developed and it works so well uh, mm. because people are finding their ways and they're coming yes. up with ways of collaborating and, and really making things happen. But um, you just mentioned uh, children's access uh, to information about their case. And one of the key elements of standard five, but also one of the key objectives of the journeys project um, is to ensure that children have access to uh, information throughout uh, their journey through uh, uh, Barna House. So can you just uh, share some of your thoughts on kind of, uh, the practicalities and the importance of ensuring that the child has access to information, advice, crisis support, and follow up after the child has been to to Barna House. What what do you observe there? Uh, well, uh, national evaluations in Sweden, as well as our own evaluations, where we have talked to children, many, pretty many children actually, um, saying that we have to inform them more than, the, than we are, uh, because they kind of lose control over their own story once they tell a police officer, for example, what happens next and so on. So it's very, very important to, to kind of, in, in every little way of the process, see, okay, what kind of information does the child need? And also remembering that um, saying, I don't know, is also information. No, because that is something that really sometimes we forget. <laughs> if we don't know, if we don't, if we don't think that we have some, something to kind of say that to the child or something in use, to 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 add, um, we don't inform them. So it's very important also to inform them within the, the vacuum, as to say, like when they don't know anything. So since a couple of years back, we have here in our working group really worked hard with looking into like really really looked into di different kind of uh, details in the in our process where we can do it better, where we can inform them, where we can and, and we can always improve. Mm. And since we don't have this kind of documentation that I that I was talking about, and as you mentioned um, at here at Barnahus, it's even more important to see that they have information where they need information. Uh, maybe they from from a social worker that they are meeting several times, or their legal special representative, uh, or the prosecutor, or the police. That some at least that we don't forget. It doesn't really matter who gives the information as long as you don't get forget to give it to the child. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's very important. So in, in practical terms, how does that happen throughout the cases? What kind of information do the children receive, for example, before or during or, or after? For example, like here in Sweden, the most often here in Bono in Lean Shopping, the social welfare is the one are the one that uh, that are going to the school, picking up the child, driving the child to Barna House without the parents. The parents of most often don't know about it, and it's the special representative and the law and all the um, uh, court court that decides that it can happen. Uh, so on the way to Barna House. We have a brochure uh, that you can show to the child, mostly with pictures in it. And what to say to the child, the social welfare office have their kind of little checklist, what to say and what not to say. And also uh, to make sure you have the right child, that you bring the right child to Bonahus, you know? Uh, that kind of identification is very important as well. So we have, that. that's kind of one thing on the way to Bonahus. And when they come here, who is going to say welcome to them and, and tell what the, and the, and the uh, person from the staff, from the police that are going to do these forensic interviews, go in and, and inform the child what is happening, 
and the children always get information about you know uh you're not here because you have done something bad or uh, uh you can uh, it's up to you what one what you want to say or if you want to say anything or if you want to go into the room or it's very important to give the information that it you can't force a child in here you can't force them to anything mm -hmm. um so in every kind of different yeah and afterwards after the forensic interviews, when they go back home to the parents, for example, they're like a model in the most of our municipalities or the or all of the municipalities that people come home from the social welfare office the same day to the, the same evening to the family. Uh, they talk about this, they, they kind of address what has happened and so on. So I mean, in different kind of, but as I said, right now we are looking into a little bit in it, in it tiny detail what we can do better what where are we missing mm. Mm. thank you i have a question in the chat uh, q a that i will start with and then perhaps if there are there's one minute you can give us a very brief answer to the other questions who coordinates the case between the agencies we do <laughs> we we at Barnahus team do mm. yeah so can you tell us a little bit more about that that role how does that what does that look like it's like for example if the police will have a forensic interview with the child they call us to to kind of book the room for that because it is happening here in Bonahus, of course and if uh, the social if a social worker says okay i have a case that we want to take up in this joint consultation meeting they call us and then we kind of call in all the others so we, we are really kind of the spider in the web as we say here <laughs> yeah thank you do many many practical things yeah okay so time flies we have two minutes left so i will actually since there aren't any other questions in the chat and because this webinar is for you i'm going to go back to those other two questions which was about the professional background of the people who work in Barnahus and what kind of training, and also if there is some multidisciplinary uh, supervision. Well, as in the Barnahus team, uh, working in, in Lean Shopping, we are uh, one psychologist and the social workers, also one um, licensed therapist, psychotherapist, and we have a hand, one team assistant, more like a um, secretary. So it's kind of a different lot, a different slot. And our training is we're coming from different places. I'm I'm I have my background mainly within the social welfare office. Uh, my colleague has it from the child and adolescent psychiatry, maybe. So we, we come from different places. And it's very important for us to kind of all the time um better our skills and, and our competence, of course. And supervision, if you mean hand leaning, Olivia? That's kind of supervision. You mean some hand leaning? Oh. Yes. <laughs> I just want so that I get the, the, the word right here. Uh, we have supervision, uh, external supervision. And I know the police have that. The social welfare officers usually have that. Uh, not maybe the prosecutors, but I know many of the partners have supervision uh, within, in their work. And, and when it comes to our partners, like the social workers or the prosecutors and the police officers, uh or maybe when i say police officers maybe not all of them are police officers but they might maybe civilians working within the police force as well they have special training of course uh do these forensic interviews with children the prosecutors are the ones that have been working for a while more than seniors that they, they are they are not the new prosecutors and there are three of them that we are working together with so it's not any one of them there are three of us three of them now they are kind of bound to us. Um, social workers come and go in another way, unfortunately, because there's so many. We we have nine municipalities that belongs to us, and we have said that it's over hundred social workers that can be coming to us, and um, so it's really <laughs> this is about repeat, repeat, repeat. And now today we have the tea meeting in the morning. We said once again. We think we should have more crisis support here. Where are they? We have to reach out to the social welfare office and again repeat and remind them that we have this because there are new ones coming all the time. So 
it's a continuous work really really it is and it's fun <laughs> sometimes you feel a bit okay here we go again but it's fun <laughs> yes so patience uh, is uh, our new element to the standard five yes <laughs> so, <And> flexibility <laughs> exactly flexibility within the agreement kind of yes that's great uh, I am really sorry to say that we have come to the end of our uh, webinar. This was a quick tour uh, about the Barnhouse Quality Standard number five. Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you to all the participants. I believe that we have a short survey uh, that we kindly ask you to stay and um, respond to and also you can find a lot more information on our website barnahus.eu and please do not hesitate to contact us if you want us to share some of the documents that Anna has talked about or other uh, helpful practical tools that we have at our uh, disposal. Laura, do I hand over to you perhaps? Yeah, well, yes, uh, thank you. I, I was going to say about the exit, exit poll, but it's already on and I see that uh, people are answering. So we, it's, it's pretty, pretty much it. We just wait a few seconds. Thank you so much, Olivia. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much and good luck. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think it's just a few seconds before the, the call ends. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to respond to the exit poll and uh, yeah, for participating in today's webinar. We hope you found it useful.